happened upon Striding Edge, I haven't had it before. It's absolutely perfect beer for talking about body and mouthfeel. It's a low ABV beer, it's low residual sweetness, but it's got a real fullness to it. So this talk is really ultimately, how is it that they can do that? You know, what techniques and tips I can give you. Um, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, so we'll finish relatively early, because I'm interested to hear your ideas as well as to how you achieve it in the brew house, and we can perhaps share some, share some ideas. But really, when... <coughs> oh, it's not going to be a punch-up, is this? <coughs> I know I'm, I know I'm Glaswegian, but uh, we don't need to go that far. <coughs> so ultimately, when we're talking about body and mouth feel, we're talking about these trigeminal effects, these kind of mouth coating effects. What you know, these, there are chemicals within beer that give those effects, um, and we can enhance them through different mashing techniques. Um, so ultimately, um, today I want to talk about mashing science and how we ultimately enhance dextrins, because that's really the core of this topic. It's really about dextrins um, and preserving those dextrins within the mashing regime. I want to talk about how we can add dextrins in. So using different um, malt types, but not just malt, but also non-malted cereals um, and other, um, other uh, specialty ingredients. I'll briefly talk, because it's primarily about mashing, but I will also briefly touch on um, salts, or oh, it's not my area of expertise. I'll also briefly talk about yeast. Again, not my area of expertise, but um, if you want to know more about that, then you can go and see the Lallemann guys um, upstairs. So ultimately, I think, we're going to come back to the, the principal science of mashing, what's actually going on in the mash tank. So if we, if we think through the actual stages of, of, uh, of the mashing process, we're adding <clears throat> water and malt together, um, crushed grain. That water, if provided it's of a certain temperature, is going to start to gelatinize the starch. So that's the first key stage. It's going to start to unravel that starch and allow enzymes to attack it. If the water's not at a sufficient temperature, that process won't happen and you'll get a really low OG. And that happens in somewhere in the region of 59 to 63 degrees. If you're below 59 degrees for a mash, you're not going to get much extract and ultimately you're not going to get much in the way of, um, um, yeah, of, of alcohol. Although you'll probably get a hell of a lot of body because the enzymes haven't had an opportunity to not only produce um, maltose, but they're not going to have produced dextrins either. So I suppose that's one technique, don't gelatinize the starch, but I wouldn't recommend it. So first of all, it's going to gelatinize the starch. Then the alpha amylase is going to start acting. And that alpha amylase has got quite a wide range of action. And really, the alpha amylase has done its job within about 30 minutes. Most malts, have, um, base malts, um, ale malts, have a saccharifying time of about 30 minutes. The alpha amylase has done its job. It's created all that maltose, maltotriose, um, a set of sugars that can then um, start to be acted upon by the beta amylase. Um, which is going to come along a bit like Pac-Man. I always think of beta amylase as the Pac-Man. It's coming along and it's chopping up the dextrins into maltose and maltotriols. Um, those are the fermentable sugars. So body is really all about preserving non-fermentable sugars. So we've got fermentable sugars and non-fermentable sugars, the fermentables being maltose, maltotriols, um, little chunks of um, fructose as well. Um, and the non-fermentable sugars being this big pile of dextrins, okay? So, how is it that we preserve the, uh, the, the dextrins in the mashing regime? Well, there's a number of different ways of doing it. Ultimately, it's really all about time, temperature, pH, and mash thickness. So, I'll go um, through each of them. So, hopefully, everybody knows a bit about temperature. The beta, um, the beta amylase, uh, acts in the core range of around about 62 to 65 degrees, much above that, and, it's, and it starts to denature. Um, so if you want a really full beer, you want, um, you, want, you want to limit the action of beta amylase, then mash higher with temperature. And that's really the mechanism why we, we have that higher temperature mashing. So up towards the high 60s into the low 70s, it's pr um, preferring alpha amylase, not beta amylase, so you're going to get lots of um, residual non-fermentable sugars, these dextrins. So that's number one. Number two is about time. So if the alpha amylase has already created all the, um, all the sugar within about 30 minutes, then just shorten your mash. Just bring it down to, you, you could quite happily mash out after 40 minutes, and you would have a lot of body and a lot of mouthfeel in the beer. Um, and without having to vary that temperature. If you, for example, if, you don't, if you're not confident with temperature control or you don't have very reliable equipment when it comes to temperature control, then just use time as a factor as opposed to, um, uh, as opposed to using temperature. 
The third one is pH. So certainly the use of acids and salts is going to affect your pH. Um, and the, the different enzymes react um, or, or have an optimal pH range. So when it comes to beta amylase, we're really talking about quite a low range in terms of pH 4 to 5. So if you want the beta amylase, um, if you want more of that, um, you want more fermentables, i.e. less body, then come down in, in pH. If you want more, um, more body, less fermentables, then come up in pH. So around about uh, 5.4, for example, push it towards the optimum range for alpha amylase. Um, away from beta, you're going to get a fuller beer doing that as well. Now, mass thickness. This is a real misnomer. So I've heard before people saying, Thick mash, thick beer. It's the opposite way around. Thick mashes will protect the beta um, amylase enzyme. So that means that we're going to get um, we're going to get a thinner beer because it's going to allow the beta amylase more time to act um, or more opportunity to act upon the sugars um, producing uh, producing the fermentables. So thicker mashes are going to produce thinner beers. So have that in mind. Don't think thick, thick, thin, thin. It doesn't work like that. Um, so that's that's another technique that you could use um, as well. Beta amylase is, uh, is actually called maltose hydrolase. So think think about beta amylase as producing maltose, as producing fermentable sugars. Um, there we go. Okay, so that's really the mashing dynamics. Has anybody else got mashing techniques that they use for producing thicker, fuller body beers just in the actual mashing phase itself? I hope I've covered all four points there. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, cool, good stuff. OK, so that's how we can pre actually preserve it within, I'm talking about in a standard mash, say, like, almost like 100% ale malt, effectively. Um, we move on to actual uh, specialty malts now. So specialty malts have a couple of different ways of adding body and mouthfeel. Continuing on the, the, from, from the, the, the first part, adding dextrins. So caramel, caramelized malts, the, the process that, um, that we actually use to produce caramel malts is all about really creating dextrin within the kernel of the, um, of the barley. So um, in, the, in the malting process, um, to produce caramel malts, uh, we use uh, green malt, we then recirculate warm air. The actual um, the starch inside the kernel liquefies and it starts to um, go through the same process as what happens during the mashing process in, in a brewery. Um, it starts to, um, the, the enzymes start to act within the barley kernel and they'll actually start to produce dextrin. So anything in the caramel range, anything that's pretty much got cara in the front or crystal in the front is going to have quite a lot of dextrins to it. So obviously the lighter you go, um, the less colour you're going to add. So if you want to add body, um, but less colour, then go for something like a, I don't know, a Crystal 60 or a Cara Gold, a Cara Malt, something like that. Cara Pills, I mean, the name is in the title there. It's a very, very, very light um, malt in terms of colour, but it's got lots of dextrins in there. The other way we can do it um, with specialty malts is by adding something <laughs> that we make, which is called dextrin malt. But this is a real misnomer because it doesn't actually add dextrins. What dextrin malt is, is a really under-modified malt. And what, what I mean by modification is the amount of time that it's had in the malting process to convert the really complex structures within raw barley into what you would have in malt. Um, and the way that we make uh, dextrin malt at crisp is that we, we, under, we under-modify, we do a, a short germination. That means that the protein doesn't have as much time to break down. So what we're actually adding when you add uh, dextrin malt in, in the mash, you're adding protein. Because protein itself has quite a good kind of mouth coating effect, um, so you can add uh, you can add dextrin malt for, for that reason. Um, other types of cereals that we can add to add in protein or or other um, other chemicals that coat the mouth that have that sort of um, that effect. Um, not only protein, but beta glucan is quite good for it as well. So things like uh, wheat, uh, wheat, uh, wheat malt, torrefied wheat, got a lot of protein in it there. That gives that mouth coating effect and body, um, so that's quite good. Um, oats, certainly, I mean, the, the popularity of oats just now with any IPA is you get that real fullness, and that's really coming from the beta glucan in the oats. Rye has a similar effect as well because of the relatively high levels of, uh, of beta glucan. Um, so you can use these, these sorts of um, non malted cereals to add those, uh, to add those body and mouthfeel effects. Um, even something like torrefied barley 
because it doesn't, um, because the, the proteins haven't been broken down in the malting process. Um, torrifying, does anyone know what torrifying actually is? I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick lesson on what torrifying is. So, torrifying is basically like popcorn making. So, we just put the raw grain through a process of um, being exposed to very, very hot air. And all that really does, it disrupts the cell walls, um, it allows, um, it allows the water when you're, when you're mashing the non-malted cereals, it allows that water to get in and start using some of the, it starts to, it breaks the starch out effectively, so it breaks down the cell walls, um, but it won't modify the proteins and things like that, so you get a lot of body and mouthfeel from, from non-malted torrified cereals. Um, so that's what that is. Um, when it comes to water chemistry, I am absolutely not an expert, but certainly chloride Will, will produce creaminess, will produce mouthfeel. So you think about an any IPA, so you know, chloride, you're probably looking at about 150 uh, versus a sulfate of 60 or 50, something like that, three, four, three to one ratio. Sulfate's gonna give you astringency, whereas chloride gives you smoothness and mouthfeel. So that's certainly an, an effect of um, modifying your salts regime. So have a real look at, a close look at your water chemistry when you want to enhance these things. And um, there's a lot of, in, in my personal experience, a lot of people just simply don't treat the water um, for different beer styles, but really get into that. It's, it's a complex area and it can be a bit daunting, but there's some real simple guides online for doing that. So I think that's, that can really take, a, um, take your beers a step up by, by doing proper water chemistry. Um, Rob's just joined us from Lalaman, which is great because he's the yeast expert. But um, when it comes to yeast, we can also, um, we can use the yeast to enhance um, body and mouthfeel. Certain yeasts will um, metabolize maltotriose, others will not. I personally don't know which ones do, so talk to the talk to the yeast guys about that. But again, that's that's all about preserving um, certain sugars and mouth coating sugars. And so if it doesn't ferment maltotriose, then you're gonna get more body and more perceived sweetness as well. Um, so that can be quite useful. Um, and the reason that, um, so on, on the opposite side, the reason that sour beers are so dry is because the, uh, the diastatic yeast strain will assimilate all sugars. So um, all those detrins that are left at the end of mashing, um, the, the yeast produces an enzyme called amylopicosidase, which strips absolutely all sugar out and makes it all fermentable. So it produces a really super dry beer. And um, that's, that's the reason that sour beers use diastaticus. So, um, yeah, that's, that's perhaps the, the opposite way of producing body to, to get the dryness. Um, there are other um, things that you can put into beer which, which give a perception of body, of, of sweetness. Um, for example, in sour beers, um, the, the lactobacillus will produce uh, glycerol. And now glycerol is, um, gives that mouth coating effect as well. So you can have a really, really dry beer in a sour, um, a sour beer, but you can have a perception of body and sweetness that's been produced. Uh, by the glycerol, um, so that's that's another another way of doing it. So when we talk about body and mouthfeel, these are trigeminal effects. They're the nerve endings within your mouth. Um, they're the same ones that are on your skin. They, um, they it's all about the sensations within the mouth, body, and mouthfeel. Um, and there's a real sort of emerging area of science around flavor and trigeminal effects. So look them up, look it up online. So you can add other ingredients into your beers, like. I don't know, Sichuan peppercorn, certain types of spices and herbs will also combine to produce um, body and mouthfeel effects. Um, I don't know if anyone's played around with those kind of things, but I mean, you think about chili beers, for example, they can, that's the spiciness can, can you know, cause those kind of effects in the mouth as well. So I think it's quite, quite an interesting way to go, um, go as well. So that's kind of probably about all that I have to say on body and mouthfeel. So is there anything that anybody noted or any questions that anyone got about any specific brewing problems or when it comes to body? Do you tend to get what you want in terms of thickness and mouthfeel or? Okay, just a, a couple of questions. So first off, you were saying that if you map to well, you don't, um, you don't um, blow up those starches. Yeah. Um, could you use that to your advantage? Could you split one match? Could you do a mini match that is matched yeah, I mean you could if you had the if you had the kit to be able to do it, then it's almost kind of like doing uh, 
you, you can have um, one half of your mash at one temperature, one half of your mash at another temperature, in, in a way that's sort of like, it's a bit like decoction mashing in a way. Decoction mashing is a bit more of an extreme example of it, but um, splitting things out to um, optimize different enzymes in different parts of the mash, you, yeah, you can certainly do that and then recombine everything. Um, like, a, I mean, not certainly on the continent, they would be using different temperatures for different, you know, using a step mashing regime, and that's all about optimizing certain enzymes. So, um, you, yeah, you could certainly do that. Yeah, and the, the other thing that um, pops into my mind is that there's a, there's a lot of um, brewers and breweries that are starting to try and make um, gluten free beers, mm -hmm. and the enzymes that you use for that have a tendency to strip out some of the mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. um, are there any. Um, tricks that you could use to bring that mouthfeel back in for those, those uh, producing the two days. What kind of enzymes are you talking about, like a uh, brewer's clarex type? Yeah, I think that's, that's yeah. Yeah, it, it, the, the problem, I guess the problem with clarex is that it sort of indiscriminately cleaves all um, all proteins and it just so happens that it, it, will, um, it will take out the gluten one. Um, I think that's really about preserving it. You want to preserve dextrins in that in that situation. So Clarex acts. If we're talking specifically about Clarex, it's acting on proteins rather than than sugars. So just as long as you you know you've kept your your mass temperature relatively high um, to um, to preserve those dextrins, then that's that's probably the way I would go with that. Maybe add some um, cereals where you've got some beta glucans in there as well. As long as you're not too worried about. Um, sticky mashes, but you know, add a bit of oats in there or something like that. Um, on a homebrew scale, you probably use a gluten-free oat milk. Gluten-free oat milk. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Scale, okay. You use that sort of towards either sort of mid ferment, so you can still ferment it out, but you get sort of all of that. You get all that creaminess and silkiness coming through. Oh, that's really interesting. There you go. That's awesome. There you go. Yes. Well, mine was. Referring back to what you said earlier, in that, uh, I've got quite a lot of old recipes which um, start up at 50 degrees mm -hmm. and then work their way through different stages. Yeah. And I just wondered about your thoughts and the rationale behind it. Well, I mean, I think the rationale behind it, if, if it's an, I mean, how old are we talking? Uh, recipes dating back pre 1970. Right, okay. Well, I think. The, the way that malting has changed, certainly, maybe in the UK, I can't speak for the continent, but what we are producing really now in the UK is extremely well modified malt. The, the rationale for using sort of um, 50 de degree regimes is about um, breaking down or continuing the process of breaking down proteins that really should have happened in the malting process. Um, that can certainly be the case if you're using um, continental. So basically, we've outgrown yeah. it now. We've outgrown it. Yeah. The technology to be able to exactly. improve the quality of the. Malt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, by using um, British pale malt, then you really shouldn't need to um, do anything down in the 50s. Thank you. Unless you're doing a wheat beer and you're looking for, you know, enhanced ferulic acid, things like that, that's, that's a very different area. But when it comes to ale malts, um, even in British lager malts, you simply don't need to step mash. Fair? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm just checking with the German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, you, if you're buying stuff out from the continent, you're probably going to need to play around with that. Yeah. Yes? The most question of you said about short mashing to enhance spotting. Yeah. And the best way, what would you take the best way to say when is your stop mashing your mash and start to mash out? Uh huh. Is it maybe like a kind of a test? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, a, a, um, by using a iodine test, you can check that all the starch has been converted um, into either fermentable or, or non-fermentable sugar. And you certainly don't want any starch and in, in going ahead into your beer. It can, it can certainly cause problems. But um, yeah, well modified malts. You can actually ask a maltster for the for for the saccharification time, which um, is. It's not reported on all certificates of analysis, but um, they'll actually tell you how long it should take. But um, I would have thought something like 30 minutes. You, your alpha amylase has pretty much done its done its job. It's chopped up the starch. So, you agree? Uh, depending, like a lot of malts, probably 15. Yeah. Uh, extra pale, 25. Yeah. Minutes. So the, I mean, the determining factor really there, 
not just obviously temperature, but um, the uh, the amount of enzyme packet in the in the actual malt. So what we refer to as DP and DU on the certificate of analysis. So there are certain malt types which are really high in DP and DU. So the enzymes will simply there's more enzyme about effectively, so they will act faster um, on a on a smaller um, on the same quantity of malt run. So um, you get some American. Um, malts which are ridiculously high and they take no time at all to, for these enzymes to act or they're referred to as hot malts so um the other, the other thing i suppose is that you know when you when you use lots of specialty malts there's less enzyme about so you're slowing things down as well so if you're using a lot of specialty malts then i wouldn't i wouldn't shorten the mash you just got to be careful there so, yeah. yes question about the crush yeah yeah I think really when it comes to crush, um, and there's something I, I was speaking about yesterday, crush is really going to determine um, extract efficiency and original gravity rather than um, I mean, I think body and mouthfeel, well, body and mouthfeel is intrinsically linked to, to final gravity. So um, really crushes, you know, the coarseness of the crush, the fineness of the crush is going to determine how much um, initial um, sugar you get out and how much starch is available really for conversion. So um, I, I don't personally don't think it is going to have a huge effect. If, if it was really super fine, then you could be pulling through a bit more you might um, you pull through maybe a little bit more protein or something like that, but um, you'd have a stuck mash if it was at that level of fineness anyway. So, um, like polyphenol, for example, polyphenol you could pull through if it was a really really fine crush. You got pH wrong, but or or too high a sparse temperature that's going to sort of push you in the other direction and give you astringency. But um, that's the only effect that I can think that crush is going to have on actual body and mouthfeel. So yeah. It doesn't, it's just because it's it's finer doesn't mean it's going to produce a richer beer. It's, that's just kind of one of these sort of perception things that we have. It doesn't work like that. Any other questions? Okay. Hopefully all that made sense.